Pappus of Alexandria, the last of the great Greek geometers, published what turns out to be a theorem of projective morphology. Choose two lines in a plane, here violet, and choose three points in each. Draw lines, here yellow, connecting the points in a circular sequence that alternates between the two ranges. We now have a yellow hexagon whose corners lie alternately in the two violet lines. Pappas showed that the intersections of opposite sides will always line up. To figure out which sides are opposite in a tangled hexagon like this, you either count your steps or label the points and then refer to the handy bourgeois hexagon included here for people who are still emerging from a Greco-Roman mindset. Here is a proof. As demonstrated in the, in the installment about perspective and projection, any two groups of three points can be associated by a projectivity. Label the points accordingly. Connect any two of the points, say A and B, with their projections, but crosswise. These are known as cross lines. Now do the same for A and C. Call the line connecting the two intersections of the cross lines P. Now you can compose the projectivity from range L to range M of a first perspectivity through A double prime to P and a second perspectivity through A to M. The intersection of L and M, let's call it X, projects to the intersection of P and M. Now suppose we had drawn P differently. Suppose we had used the cross lines of A and B as we have, and B and C instead of those of A and C. Would we get a different line P? No, P would remain the same since it would still lie in the same intersection of the cross lines A and B and also in X double prime. In the installment about projection, we proved that once three correspondences are set, all are. So X double prime will stay put. In other words, the intersections of all three pairs of cross lines, and indeed of all pairs of cross lines in a projectivity, are collinear. This is known in projective morphology as the cross line theorem, and Pappus's hexagon is an instance of it. The hexagon theorem is valid for parallel lines, too, a situation not covered by Pappus's original proof. Feel free to construct some more examples just to see that it always works. For instance, if you relabel the points, you get a different red line. Or you can leave five of the six points in place and let the other travel along its violet line, and the red Pappas line will rotate around one of the three collinear intersections. If the point passes all the way through the infinite distance and returns again from the other side, how much do you suppose the Pappas line will rotate? By the way, the theorem holds true even if the corners of the hexagon don't alternate between the ranges like that. 
All right. Now it's time. How did you know? That's right. Pause if you want to polarize on your own. It's easy. Just speak first and figure out afterwards what you have said. If the sides, not the corners, lie alternately into points, the lines connecting opposite corners are copunctual, that is, concurrent. Okay, what? Can you picture that? Pause if you want to construct it on your own. Choose two points in a plane, here pink, and choose three lines in each. Find six points connecting the lines in a circular sequence that alternates between the two pencils. We now have a blue hexagram whose sides lie alternately in the two pink points. According to the law of polarity, the lines joining opposite corners will always line up. To figure out which corners are opposite in a tangled hexagram like this, you either count your steps or label everything and then refer to the handy bourgeois hexagram included here for people who are still emerging from a Greco-Roman mindset. Here is a proof. As demonstrated in the installment about perspective and projection, any two groups of three lines can be associated by a projectivity. Label the lines accordingly. Mark the points connecting any two of the lines, say A and B, with their projections, but crosswise. These are known as cross points. Draw the line connecting them. Now do the same for A and C. Call the intersection of the two connectors of the cross points P. Now you can compose the projectivity from pencil L to pencil M of a first perspectivity through A double prime to P and a second perspectivity through A to M. The connector of L and M, let's call it X, projects to the connector of P and M. Now suppose we had marked P differently. Suppose we had used the cross points of A and B, as we have, and B and C instead of those of A and C. Would we get a different point P? No, P would remain the same, since it would still lie in the same connector of the cross points of A and B, and also in X double prime. In the installment about projection, we proved that once three correspondences are set, all are. So X double prime will stay put. In other words, the connectors of all three pairs of cross points, and indeed of all pairs of cross points in a projectivity, are copunctual. This is known in projective morphology as the cross point theorem. And the theorem polar to Pappus is an instance of it. Of course, the hexagram theorem is valid for parallel lines, too. Feel free to construct some more examples just to see that it always works. For instance, if you relabel the lines, 
the yellow lines intersect somewhere else. Or you can leave five of the six blue lines in place and let the other rotate in its pink point. And the intersection of the yellow lines will travel along one of the three yellow lines. How much do you suppose the blue line has to rotate for the intersection of the yellow lines to pass all the way through the infinite distance and return again from the other side? By the way, the theorem holds true even if the sides of the hexagram don't alternate between the pencils like that. Do all hexagons behave like those of Pappus, with opposite sides meeting in three collinear points? Certainly not. Do any, other than those whose corners lie in two lines, Actually, yes. Namely, all hexagons lying on conic sections. That's right. Those two lines are a degenerate conic. And the theorem of Pappus is a special case of a more general truth. Pascal discovered this but metrically, when he was 16 years old, while the other kids were out jamming on their theorbos or doing whatever the young people were into back then, if indeed teenagers had even been invented yet. If the corners of a hexagon lie in a conic, you could also say, given any hexagon inscribed in a conic, the intersections of opposite sides lie in a straight line. That is the line shown here in red, known as the Pascal line. Only as Jagon was propounding the law of polarity did anyone formulate Pascal's theorem in morphological terms and find the polar theorem, namely Brianchon. 166 years after Pascal's hexagon theorem. To polarize here, you have to say if the sides of a hexagram lie in a conic. That is to say, if they are tangents. That is to say, given a hexagram circumscribing a conic. Here is a non-tangled example. Question. Since Pascal is a generalization of Pappus and Brianchon is the polar theorem to Pascal, shouldn't Brianchon be a generalization of the polar theorem to Pappus? Answer. Yes. So in the polar theorem to Pappus, do the six lines in two points also all lie tangent to some kind of degenerate conic? Yes, indeed. They are all tangents to the two ends of an ellipse so narrow it has flattened out to a mere line segment or to an equally, equally narrow hyperbola. Pascal's theorem follows from Steiner's pointwise conic, which was shown and proved in two recent installments. Choose any five coplanar points, A, C, D, E, and F. Draw AF and CD and call their intersection X. Also draw DE and EF. Choose any new line in A and project it from A to DE to X to EF to C. 
According to Steiner, projective lines in A and C intersect on a conic. And by the laziness corollary shown previously, this setup means the original five points themselves lie in the conic. The points are labeled alphabetically here as a Pascal hexagon. Briand-Champ's theorem follows from Steiner's linewise conic, which was shown and proved in two recent installments. Choose any five coplanar lines A, C, D, E, and F. Connect the intersections of AF and CD and call their connector X. Also mark DE and EF. Choose any new point in A and project it from A to DE to X to EF to C. According to Steiner, projective points in A and C connect on a conic. That is, they connect in a tangent to a conic. And by the laziness corollary shown previously, this setup means the original five lines themselves lie in the conic. The points are labeled alphabetically here as a Briand-Champ hexagram. The theorems of Pascal and Briand-Champ use precisely six points and six lines, because like Pappas, they involve the determination of a projectivity, and for this, three pairs are necessary, as established in the presentation on perspective and projection. For those of you who already know what an involution is, here is another way of looking at these theorems. The Pascal line is the axis of projectivity of an involution on a conic. And the Briand-Champ point is the center of projectivity of an involution on a conic. Note that, of course, with Briand-Champ's theorem, relabeling the sides of the hexagram will again give you a different point of intersection of the principal diagonals. In fact, it will give you 60 such Briand-Champ points. Here are the Briand-Champ points of the regular hexagram. There are fewer than 60 because with all that symmetry some of them coincide. The green lines represent infinitely distant Briand-Champ points. And here are the Pascal lines of the regular hexagon. Again, there would be 60 if not for all the symmetry. By the way, it was the great Steiner who discovered there are 60. The red point symbolizes the infinitely distant line of the plane, which is the Pascal line of the non-tangled regular hexagon. For those of you who already know what pole and polar mean, not to be confused with the polarizing of theorems, these Pascal lines are the polars of the Briand-Champ points of the corresponding hexagram. For instance, corresponding to the infinitely distant line is the point at the center. And that provides a way to find the center of any conic. Of course, in this context, center is a metric notion, so to find the center you need a metric device, namely parallels. Give your hexagon parallel sides to make the Pascal line the infinitely distant line. Then construct the corresponding Briand-Champ hexagram consisting of the tangents at the corners of the hexagon. Oh, you don't know how to construct a tangent to a given tangent point on a conic? 
With the help of Pascal's theorem, it's easy. Draw a line truncating the hexagon to a pentagon and label the pentagon as a hexagon. The side at the double point will be the tangent. Next, draw the line connecting the intersection of FA and CD with the intersection of BC and EF, which in this case is infinitely distant. In other words, this is the line connecting intersections of opposite sides, also known as the Pascal line of the new five-cornered hexagon. So where the Pascal line meets DE, so does AB. And there is the tangent. Eventually, you have the whole circumhexagram. And no, its sides are not likely to be parallel. Corresponding to the infinitely distant Pascal line is the Brionchon point at the center of the curve. Of course, there are easier ways of finding the center, but this construction shows the correspondence. Just for shock value, here is the result of this construction when carried out on a parabola. The orange segments are a tangled Pascal hexagon with parallel sides. The blue tangents are the corresponding tangled Brionchon hexagram, and the red parallels intersect at the Brionchon point, which is the center of the parabola. The center is actually on the parabola. It is, in fact, the point where the parabola lies tangent to the infinitely distant line, way off to the right, and to the left. Deal with it. Last time, we saw that once five points of a conic are set, so are all the rest. And that likewise, once five lines of a conic, which is to say tangents, are set, so are all the rest. The theorems of Pascal and Brionchon provide another way of finding further points and further lines, respectively. Given five points in a plane, find more on the same conic. If two of the five are infinitely distant, the conic is a hyperbola. The idea is to find a sixth point, here f such that the resulting hexagon fulfills Pascal's theorem. One intersection of opposite sides is available right away. In that intersection, draw any line to be the Pascal line, where BC meets the Pascal line, so does EF and where CD meets the Pascal line, so does FA. So now we have EF and FA, and obviously they intersect in F. To find more points of the curve, erase all but the first two lines, choose a different Pascal line, and repeat the same procedure. Given five lines in a plane, find a sixth on the same conic. If one of the five is the infinitely distant line, the conic is a parabola. The idea is to find a sixth line, here f, such that the resulting hexagram fulfills Brionchon's theorem. 
one connector of opposite corners is available right away. In that connector, draw any point to be the Brillanchon point. Where BC aligns with the Brillanchon point, so does EF. And where CD aligns with the Brillanchon point, so does FA. So now we have EF and FA, and obviously they connect in F. To find more lines of the curve, erase the Brillanchon point and the last two principal di diagonals, choose a different Brillanchon point, and repeat the same procedure. We already saw that given five points, you can use Pascal's theorem to find the tangent to their conic at any one of them, namely by counting it as a double point. Given five lines, find the tangent point of their conic on any one of them, namely by counting it as a double line. In other words, we need the intersection of F and A. Two of the lines connecting opposite corners are already available, so that gives us, gives us the Brillanchon point. And through it, CD aligns with FA. Oh, you assumed that identical lines had no particular point of intersection? Well, now we are learning that that depends on the context. To find all five tangent points, draw a star. <laughs>